This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan Mysticism A Study in Nature and Development of Spiritual Consciousness by Evelyn Underhill Part 1 The Mystic Fact What the world, which truly knows nothing, calls mysticism, is the science of ultimates, the science of self-evident reality, which cannot be reasoned about, because it is the object of pure reason or perception. The babe sucking its mother's breast, and the lover returning, after twenty years' separation, to his home and food in the same bosom, are the types and princes of mystics. Coventry Patmore The Rod, the Root, and the Flower The First Half of Chapter One The Point of Departure The most highly developed branches of the human family have in common one peculiar characteristic. They tend to produce, sporadically it is true, and often in the teeth of adverse external circumstances, a curious and definite type of personality, a type which refuses to be satisfied with that which other men call experience, and is inclined, in the words of its enemies, to deny the world in order that it may find reality. We meet these persons in the East and the West, in the ancient, medieval, and modern worlds. Their one passion appears to be the prosecution of a certain spiritual and intangible quest, the finding of a way out or a way back to some desirable state in which alone they can satisfy their craving for absolute truth. This quest for them has constituted the whole meaning of life. They have made for it without effort sacrifices which have appeared enormous to other men, and it is an indirect testimony to its objective actuality that whatever the place or period in which they have arisen, their aims, doctrines and methods have been substantially the same. Their experience, therefore, forms a body of evidence, curiously self-consistent and often mutually explanatory, which must be taken into account before we can add up the sum of the energies and potentialities of the human spirit, or reasonably speculate on its relations to the unknown world, which lies outside the boundaries of sense. All men, at one time or another, have fallen in love with the veiled Isis, whom they call truth. With most, this has been a passing passion. They have early seen its hopelessness, and turn to more practical things. But others remain all their lives the devout lovers of reality, though the manner of their love, the vision which they make to themselves of the beloved object, varies enormously. Some see truth as Dante saw Beatrice, an adorable yet intangible figure, found in this world, yet revealing the next. To others, she seems rather an evil, but an irresistible enchantress, enticing, demanding payment, and betraying her lover at the last. Some have seen her in a test-tube, and some in a poet's dream, some before the altar, others in the slime. The extreme pragmatists have even sought her in the kitchen, declaring that she may best be recognized by her utility. Last stage of all, the philosophic skeptic has comforted an unsuccessful courtship by assuring himself that his mistress is not really there. Under whatsoever symbols they have objectified their quest, none of these seekers have ever been able to assure the world that they have found, seen face to face, the reality behind the veil. But if we may trust the reports of the mystics, and they are reports given with a strange accent of certainty and good faith, they have succeeded where all these others have failed, in establishing immediate communication between the spirit of man, entangled as they declare amongst material things, and that only reality, that immaterial and final being, which some philosophers call the absolute, and most theologians call God. This, they say, and here many who are not mystics agree with them, 
is the hidden truth, which is the object of man's craving, the only satisfying goal of his quest. Hence, they should claim from us the same attention that we give to other explorers of countries in which we are not competent to adventure ourselves. For the mystics are the pioneers of the spiritual world, and we have no right to deny validity to their discoveries, merely because we lack the opportunity or the courage necessary to those who would prosecute such explorations for themselves. It is the object of this book to attempt a description, and also, though this is needless for those who read that description in good faith, a justification of these experiences and the conclusions which have been drawn from them. So remote, however, are these matters from our ordinary habits of thought, that their investigation entails, in those who would attempt to understand them, a definite preparation, a purging of the intellect. As with those who came of old to the mysteries, purification is here the gate of knowledge. We must come to this encounter with minds cleared of prejudice and convention, must deliberately break with our inveterate habit of taking the visible world for granted. Our lazy assumption that somehow science is real and metaphysics is not. We must pull down our own card houses, descend, as the mystics say, into our nothingness, and examine for ourselves the foundations of all possible human experience, before we are in a position to criticize the buildings of the visionaries, the poets, and the saints. We must not begin to talk of the unreal world of these dreamers until we have discovered, if we can, a real world with which it may be compared. Such a criticism of reality is of course the business of philosophy. I need hardly say that this book is not written by a philosopher, nor is it addressed to students of that imperial science. Nevertheless, amateurs though we be, we cannot reach our starting point without trespassing to some extent on philosophic ground. That ground covers the whole area of first principles, and it is to first principles that we must go, if we would understand the true significance of the mystic type. Let us then begin at the beginning, and remind ourselves of a few of the trite and primary facts which all practical persons agree to ignore. That beginning, for human thought, is of course the I, the ego, the self-conscious subject which is writing this book, or the other self-conscious subject which is reading it, and which declares in the teeth of all arguments, I am. Here is a point as to which we all feel quite sure. No metaphysician has yet shaken the ordinary individual's belief in his own existence. The uncertainties only begin for most of us when we ask what else is. To this I, this conscious self imprisoned in the body like an oyster in his shell, come, as we know, a constant stream of messages and experiences. Chief amongst these are the stimulation of the tactile nerves, whose result we call touch, the vibrations taken up by the optic nerve which we call light, and those taken up by the ear and perceived as sound. What did these experiences mean? The first answer of the unsophisticated self is that they indicate the nature of the external world. It is to the evidence of her senses that she turns, when she is asked what the world is like. From the messages received through those senses, which pour in on her whether she will or no, battering upon her gateways at every instant and from every side, she constructs that sense world which is the real and solid world of normal men. As the impressions come in, or rather those interpretations of the original impressions which her nervous system supplies, she pounces on them, much as players in the spelling game pounce on the separate letters dealt out to them. She sorts, accepts, rejects, combines, and then triumphantly produces from them a concept which is, she says, the external world. With an enviable and amazing simplicity, she attributes her own sensations to the unknown universe. The stars, she says, are bright. The grass is green. For her, as the philosopher Hume, reality consists in impressions and ideas. It is immediately apparent, however, that this sense-world, 
this seemingly real external universe, though it may be useful and valid in other respects, cannot be the external world, but only the self's projected picture of it. It is a work of art, not a scientific fact, and, whilst it may well possess the profound significance proper to great works of art, is dangerous if treated as a subject of analysis. Very slight investigation shows that it is a picture whose relation to reality is at best symbolic and approximate, and which would have no meaning for selves whose senses or channels of communication happen to be arranged upon a different plan. The evidence of the senses, then, cannot be accepted as evidence of the nature of ultimate reality. Useful servants, they are dangerous guides. Nor can their testimony disconcert those seekers whose report they appear to contradict. The conscious self sits, so to speak, at the receiving end of a telegraph wire. On any other theory than that of mysticism, it is her one channel of communication with the hypothetical external world. The receiving instrument registers certain messages. She does not know, and, so long as she remains dependent on that instrument, never can know, the object, the reality at the other end of the wire, by which those messages are sent. Neither can the messages truly disclose the nature of that object. But she is justified on the whole in accepting them as evidence that something exists beyond herself and her receiving instrument. It is obvious that the structural peculiarities of the telegraphic instrument will have exerted a modifying effect upon the message. That which is conveyed as dash and dot, colour and shape, may have been received in a very different form. Therefore this message, though it may in a partial sense be relevant to the supposed reality at the other end, can never be adequate to it. There will be fine vibrations which it fails to take up, others which it confuses together. Hence a portion of the message is always lost, or in other language, there are aspects of the world which we can never know. The sphere of our possible intellectual knowledge is thus strictly conditioned by the limits of our own personality. On this basis, not the ends of the earth, but the external termini of our own sensory nerves are the termini of our explorations and to know oneself is really to know one's universe. We are locked up with our receiving instruments. We cannot get up and walk away in the hope of seeing whither the lines lead. Eckhart's words are still final for us. The soul can only approach created things by the voluntary reception of images. Did some mischievous demiers choose to tickle our sensory apparatus in a new way, we should receive by this act a new universe. William James once suggested as a useful exercise for young idealists a consideration of the changes which would be worked in our ordinary world if the various branches of our receiving instruments exchanged duties. If, for instance, we heard all colours and saw all sounds. Such a remark throws a sudden light on the strange and apparently insane statement of the visionary St. Martin. I heard flowers that sounded and saw notes that shone, and on the reports of other mystics concerning a rare moment of consciousness in which the senses are fused into a single and ineffable act of perception, and colour and sound are known as aspects of one thing. Since music is but an interpretation of certain vibrations undertaken by the ear, and colour an interpretation of other vibrations performed by the eye, this is less mad than it sounds, and may yet be brought within the radius of physical science. Did such an alteration of our senses take place, the world would still send us the same messages, that strange unknown world from which, on this hypothesis, we are hermetically sealed. But we should interpret them differently. Beauty would still be ours, though speaking in another tongue. The bird's song would then strike our retina as a pageant of colour. We should see the magical tones of the wind. Here is a great fugue the repeated and harmonised greens of the forest, the cadences of stormy skies. Did we realise how slight an adjustment of our organs is needed to initiate us into such a world, 
we should perhaps be less contemptuous of those mystics who tell us that they apprehended the absolute as heavenly music or uncreated light, less fanatical in our determination to make the solid world of common sense the only standard of reality. This world of common sense is a conceptual world. It may represent an external universe. It certainly does represent the activity of the human mind. Within that mind it is built up, and there most of us are content at ease for eye to dwell, like the soul in the palace of art. A direct encounter with absolute truth, then, appears to be impossible for normal, non mystical consciousness. We cannot know the reality, or even prove the existence, of the simplest object, though this is a limitation which few people realize acutely and most would deny. But there persists in the race a type of personality which does realize this limitation and cannot be content with the sham realities that furnish the universe of normal men. It is necessary, as it seems, to the comfort of persons of this type to form for themselves some image of the something or nothing which is at the end of their telegraph lines, some conception of being, some theory of knowledge. They are tormented by the unknowable. Ache for first principles, demand some background to the shadow show of things. In so far as man possesses this temperament, he hungers for reality and must satisfy that hunger as best he can, staving off starvation though he may not be filled. It is doubtful whether any two selves have offered themselves exactly the same image of the truth outside their gates. For a living metaphysic, like a living religion, is at bottom a strictly personal affair, a matter, as William James reminded us, of vision rather than of argument. Nevertheless, such a living metaphysic may, and if sound generally does, escape the stigma of subjectivism by outwardly attaching itself to a traditional school, as personal religion may and should outwardly attach itself to a traditional church. Let us then consider shortly the results arrived at by these traditional schools, the great classic theories concerning the nature of reality. In them, we see crystallized the best that the human intellect, left to itself, has been able to achieve. 1. The most obvious and generally accepted explanation of the world is, of course, that of naturalism or naive realism the point of view of the plain man. Naturalism states simply that we see the real world, though we may not see it very well. What seems to normal, healthy people to be there is approximately there. It congratulates itself on resting in the concrete. It accepts material things as real. In other words, our corrected and correlated sense impressions, raised to their highest point of efficiency, form for it the only valid material of knowledge. Knowledge itself being the classified results of exact observation. Such an attitude as this may be a counsel of prudence in view of our ignorance of all that lies beyond. But it can never satisfy our hunger for reality. It says, in effect, the room in which we find ourselves is fairly comfortable. Draw the curtains for the night is dark and let us devote ourselves to describing the furniture. Unfortunately, however, even the furniture refuses to accommodate itself to the naturalistic view of things. Once we begin to examine it attentively, we find that it bounds in hints of wonder and mystery, declares aloud that even chairs and tables are not what they seem. We have seen that the most elementary criticism applied to any ordinary object of perception tends to invalidate the simple and comfortable creed of common sense, that not merely faith, but gross credulity, is needed by the mind which would accept the apparent as the real. I say, for instance, that I see a house. I can only mean by this that the part of my receiving instrument which undertakes the duty called vision is affected in a certain way, and arouses in my mind the idea, house. The idea house is now treated by me as a real house, and my further observations will be an unfolding 
enriching and defining of this image. But what the external reality is which evoked the image that I call house, I do not know and never can know. It is as mysterious, as far beyond my apprehension, as the constitution of the angelic choirs. Consciousness shrinks in terror from contact with the mighty verb to be. I may, of course, call in one sense to corroborate, as we trustfully say, the evidence of the other. Nay, approach the house and touch it. Then the nerves of my hand will be affected by a sensation which I translate as hardness and solidity. The eye, by a peculiar and wholly incomprehensible sensation called redness, and from these purely personal changes, my mind constructs and externalizes an idea which it calls red bricks. Science herself, however, if she be asked to verify the reality of these perceptions, at once declares that though the material world be real, the ideas of solidity and color are but hallucination. They belong to the human animal, not to the physical universe. Pertain to accident, not substance, as scholastic philosophy would say. The red brick, says science, is a mere convention. In reality, that bit, like all other bits of the universe, consists, so far as I know at present, of innumerable atoms whirling and dancing one about the other. It is no more solid than a snowstorm. Were you to eat of Alice in Wonderland's mushroom and shrink to the dimensions of the infra-world, each atom with its electrons might seem to you a solar system, and the red brick itself a universe. Moreover, these atoms themselves elude me as I try to grasp them. They are only manifestations of something else. Moreover, these atoms themselves elude me as I try to grasp them. They are only manifestations of something else. Could I track matter to its lair, I might conceivably discover that it has no extension, and become an idealist in spite of myself. As for redness, as you call it, that is a question of the relation between your optic nerve and the light waves which it is unable to absorb. This evening, when the sun slopes, your brick will probably be purple. A very little deviation from normal vision on your part would make it green. Even the sense that the object of perception is outside yourself may be fancy, since you as easily attribute this external quality to images seen in dreams and to waking hallucinations, as you do to those objects which, as you absurdly say, are really there. Further, there is no trustworthy standard by which we can separate the real from the unreal aspects of phenomena. Such standards as exist are conventional, and correspond to convenience, not to truth. It is no argument to say that most men see the world in much the same way, and that this way is the true standard of reality, though for practical purposes we have agreed that sanity consists in sharing the hallucinations of our neighbours. Those who are honest with themselves know that this sharing is at best incomplete. By the voluntary adoption of a new conception of the universe, the fitting of a new alphabet to the old Morse code, a proceeding which we call the acquirement of knowledge, we can and do change to a marked extent our way of seeing things, building up new worlds from old sense impressions, and transmuting objects more easily and thoroughly than any magician. Eyes and ears, says Heraclitus, are bad witnesses to those who have barbarian souls. And even those whose souls are civilized tend to see and hear all things through a temperament, in one and the same sky the poet may discover the habitation of angels, whilst the sailor sees only a promise of dirty weather ahead. Hence, artist and surgeon, Christian and rationalist, pessimist and optimist, do actually and truly live in different and mutually exclusive worlds, not only of thought, but also of, of perception. Only the happy circumstance that our ordinary speech is conventional, not realistic, permits us to conceal from one another the unique and lonely world in which each lives. Now and then an artist is born, terribly articulate, foolishly truthful, who insists on speaking as he saw. Then other men, 
lapped warmly in their artificial universe, agree that he is mad, or at the very best, an extraordinarily imaginative fellow. Moreover, even this unique world of the individual is not permanent. Each of us, as we grow and change, works incessantly and involuntarily at the remaking of our sensual universe. We behold at any specific moment not that which is, but that which we are, and personality undergoes many readjustments in the course of its passage from birth through maturity to death. The mind which seeks the real, then, in this shifting and subjective natural world, is of necessity thrown back on itself, on images and concepts which owe more to the seer than to the seen. But reality must be real for all, once they have found it, must exist in itself upon a plane of being unconditioned by the perceiving mind. Only thus can it satisfy that mind's most vital instinct, most sacred passion, its instinct for the absolute, its passion for truth. You are not asked, as a result of these antique and elementary propositions, to wipe clean the slate of normal human experience and cast in your lot with intellectual nihilism. You are only asked to acknowledge that it is but a slate, and that the white scratches upon it which the ordinary man calls facts, and the scientific realist calls knowledge, are at best relative and conventionalized symbols of that aspect of the unknowable reality at which they hint. This being so, whilst we must all draw a picture of some kind on our slate and act in relation therewith, we cannot deny the validity, though we may deny the usefulness, of the pictures which others produce, however abnormal and impossible they may seem since these are sketching an aspect of reality which has not come within our sensual field, and so does not and cannot form part of our world. Yet as the theologian claims that the doctrine of the Trinity veils and reveals not three but one, so the varied aspects under which the universe appears to the perceiving consciousness hint at a final reality, or in Kantian language, a transcendental object, which shall be not any one, yet all of its manifestations, transcending yet including the innumerable fragmentary worlds of individual conception. We begin then to ask what can be the nature of this one, and whence comes the persistent instinct which, receiving no encouragement from sense experience, apprehends and desires this unknown unity, this all-inclusive absolute, as the only possible satisfaction of its thirst for truth. Two, the second great conception of being, idealism, has arrived by a process of elimination at a tentative answer to this question. It whisks us far from the material universe, with its interesting array of things, its machinery, its law, into the pure, if thin, air of a metaphysical world. Whilst the naturalist world is constructed from an observation of the evidence offered by the senses, the idealist world is constructed from an observation of the processes of thought. There are but two things, he says in effect, about which we are sure. The existence of a thinking subject, a conscious self, and of an object, an idea, with which that subject deals. We know, that is to say, both mind and thought. What we call the universe is really a collection of such thoughts, and these, we agree, have been more or less distorted by the subject, the individual thinker, in the process of assimilation. Obviously, we do not think all that there is to be thought, conceive all that there is to be conceived. Neither do we necessarily combine in right order and proportion those ideas which we are capable of grasping. Reality, says objective idealism, is the complete, undistorted object, the big thought, of which we pick up these fragmentary hints, the world of phenomena which we treat as real being merely its shadow show or manifestation in space and time. According to the form of objective idealism here chosen from amongst many as typical, 
for almost every idealist has his own scheme of metaphysical salvation. We live in a universe which is, in popular language, the idea or dream of its creator. We, as Tweedledum explained to Alice in the most philosophic of all fairy tales, are just part of the dream. All life, all phenomena, are the endless modifications and expressions of the one transcendent object, the mighty and dynamic thought of one absolute thinker, in which we are bathed. This object, or certain aspects of it, and the place of each individual consciousness within the cosmic thought, or, as we say, our position in life, largely determines which these aspects shall be, is interpreted by the senses and conceived by the mind under limitations which we are accustomed to call matter, space, and time. But we have no reason to suppose that matter, space, and time are necessarily parts of reality, of the ultimate idea. Probability points, rather, to their being the pencil and paper with which we sketch it. As our vision, our idea of things, tends to approximate more and more to that of the eternal idea, so we get nearer and nearer to reality. For the idealist reality is simply the idea or thought of God. This, he says, is the supreme unity at which all the illusory appearances that make up the widely differing worlds of common sense, of science, of metaphysics, and of art dimly hint. This is the sense in which it can truly be said that only the supernatural possesses reality. For that world of appearance, which we call natural, is certainly largely made up of preconception and illusion, of the hints offered by the eternal real world of idea outside our gates, and the quaint concepts which we at our receiving instrument manufacture from them. There is this to be said for the argument of idealism, that in the last resort, the destinies of mankind are invariably guided not by the concrete facts of the sense-world, but by concepts which are acknowledged by every one to exist only on the mental plane. In the great moments of existence, when he rises to spiritual freedom, these are the things which every man feels to be real. It is by these and for these that he is found willing to live, work, suffer, and die. Love, patriotism, religion, altruism, fame, all belong to the transcendental world. Hence, they partake more of the nature of reality than any fact could do. And man, dimly recognizing this, has ever bowed to them as to immortal centers of energy. Religions, as a rule, are steeped in idealism. Christianity, in particular, is a trumpet call to an idealistic conception of life. Buddhism is little less. Over and over again, their scriptures tell us that only materialists will be damned. In idealism, we have perhaps the most sublime theory of being which has ever been constructed by the human intellect. A theory so sublime, in fact, that it can hardly have been produced by the exercise of pure reason alone, but must be looked upon as a manifestation of that natural mysticism, that instinct for the absolute which is latent in man. But... When we ask the idealist how we are to attain communion with the reality which he describes to us as certainly there, his system suddenly breaks down and discloses itself as a diagram of the heavens, not a ladder to the stars. This failure of idealism to find in practice the reality of which it thinks so much is due, in the opinion of the mystics, to a cause which finds epigrammatic expression in the celebrated phrase by which St. Jerome marked the distinction between religion and philosophy. Plato located the soul of man in the head. Christ located it in the heart. That is to say, idealism, though just in its premises, and often daring and honest in their application, is stultified by the exclusive intellectualism of its own methods, by its fatal trust in the scroll work of the industrious brain instead of the piercing vision of the desirous heart. It interests man, but does not involve him in its processes, does not catch him up to the new and more real life which it describes. Hence the thing that matters, the living thing, has somehow escaped it, 
and its observations bear the same relation to reality as the art of the anatomist does to the mystery of birth. End of the first half of part one, chapter one.